just some of the basic um, uh, understandings of how hedgerows work and what the, what the functions and the benefits are. Um, and so I want, um, you know, I'm hoping that most of you can come away from, um, from this presentation with some new ideas on how to design these properly for your specific situation, because um, they are very situational. So something that's going to be, um, you know, um, beneficial to a creek side out in Siletz Valley, you know, is probably not going to be the same as something that you would install um, along, you know, a really windy open field area in the Willamette Valley. Um, so we won't go into real specific um, plant um, recommendations and selections. I'll, I'll go over some examples, but we're going to provide those resources for you guys um, at the end. And so that way you can look at your own um, situation and understand what plants are gonna work best for you in your area. Um, we're also gonna talk a little bit about um, how to incorporate pollinator benefits into your design. Um, this is something that um, is, is fairly easy to do and, and it's something that you just, some key principles just to be aware of as you're um, planning these out. And then, like I said, we'll identify some resources at the end for plant selection. Um, and there are about 450 of you guys on today. And so um, my colleagues are gonna kind of help field the Q and A. Um, so hopefully they can, um, can answer those in the Q and A and they might also stop me um, if it makes sense and I can answer it um, live, but we'll have the ability to follow up at the end of this presentation as well. Um, all right. Why isn't it letting me go? There we go. So what are hedgerows? Uh, many of you probably know um, that they, they're referred to many different, as many different things. So um, essentially they are living fences. Um, they, they create a physical barrier. Um, they're also referred to as shelter belts. Um, um, a lot of times they're just referred to as uh, simply windbreaks, and a lot of times that would be like a single species of tree um, that are planted just, just for a windbreak. Um, but they do provide all these other benefits that I'll talk about as well. And conservation buffers are another um, uh, title that they can, they can go by. So all of these um, things basically refer to the same idea of planting um, lines or rows of um, trees and shrubs and plants um, to provide multiple functions. So this was just an example um, from, um, I, I think they're doing some trialing down at Berkeley um, with hedgerows and pollinators and um, they've got like the ceanothus here and some grasses and so um, they've installed this and um, to kind of showcase what they can look like in different um, areas and different situations. Um, so I thought the history of hedgerows was uh, really interesting and, and some of you probably know um, that the, um, this term hagas or hedges um, originated from the planting of the hawthorn tree in uh, medieval Europe. And so um, folks would um, plant these um, these hawthorn trees, and they incorporated a lot of other um, trees and shrubs in these as well. But this is what the name originates from. And um, again, it served a lot of different functions, but um, one of them was to support um, a really nice thriving wildlife population and provide food for birds and um, small um, animals. And they would basically um, cut you know, part of these um, plants and then lay them over. And so they were laying hedges and they would have to do this every few years. And so it got really thick and dense and it really provided a physical barrier um, for these areas. And a lot of um, the hedges were planted for basically um, a barrier. So it marked ownership of um, a lot of these smaller fields um, you know, back in that time, that was when, you know, folks were moving animals around or had small pastures with animals and it would keep their livestock in. It would kind of prevent the movement of, um, you know, stock and uh, such as sheep and cattle. And it would also keep um, predators out. 
And so that was, um, that was one of the main functions um, for these plantings. And um, someone, I don't know if he's in the program right now, but he also pointed out that, and I read about this, that it was, um, it was uh, also used for defense. So, you know, they planted these large physical barriers and, you know, it actually helped keep enemies out. Um, so while that might not be really a function of today's world, um, that was really interesting. But, you know, the way this years are going, we might have the zombie apocalypse next, and then maybe this would be a really good function for us. I don't know. Um, so you can kind of see these, you know, you've seen pictures of this patchwork kind of quilt um, English countryside. And, and again, it, it, you can see where the, the property boundary lines are in this picture. Um, so pretty interesting history. Um, the hedgehog also got its name from, um, you know, an, a little animal that lived in these hedges um, as habitat. So for, um, you know, if we move into kind of the history in the U.S., um, they, they started, um, they started breaking these hedges down and, and, and not using them as, um, as their historical function as agriculture um, kind of modernized a little bit. And, um, you know, we were using bigger equipment. Um, we didn't have maybe the manpower to um, create these, these hedges, these physical barriers. And um, the practice kind of, kind of went away as agriculture started modernizing. Um, and production shifted a little bit more to higher yields and, and just trying to get the, the most that you can out of, um, out, of your, out of your field. And so they weren't very common, um, is my understanding, in the early U.S. Um, there was a, um, a shelter belt program that USDA supported briefly um, in the 30s, and that was um, primarily, you know, on the, on the heels of the Dust Bowl, and that was um, basically to support planting of trees for windbreaks and to, to minimize soil erosion that was happening during that time. So there was um, some funding available, some federal funding at that time, um, and then it kind of went away. But now we're seeing a lot more interest, um, and I think it has to do for a lot of different reasons. We have a lot of um, a lot of farmers and small farmers that are interested in um, sustainable farming methods and conservation methods that can really add benefit to their operation um, and not see it as a, um, you know, something that's going to uh, take land out of production. It's really adding all these additional benefits that um, that we're seeing. And, and so USDA and um, other county programs are starting to kind of offer incentives um, for planting these. And I'll talk about that at the end, but this is kind of an example here of a, a nice windbreak that was well-established. Um, they have the two rows of smaller shrubs and then larger uh, evergreen trees in the back. And it just provides, you know, you can see from the farm in the front, um, provides a nice barrier to the farmstead behind it. And so kind of moving into modern day, um, you know, hedgerows or, or shelter belts, whatever we want to refer to them as, can take so many different forms. Um, they can be large, small, multi-species, um, urban, suburban, you know, I, I love this concept because you can really apply it to any scale in any uh, climate. So um, this is just a picture, a nice aerial picture that shows um, how this farm um, is utilizing, you know, just rows of trees here, uh, has kept these rows of trees to um, separate this field from, you know, this kind of encroaching urban area. So that's kind of on, you know, that urban growth boundary. And again, you know, really serves a benefit for the farmer and for the, um, for this little suburban neighborhood here. So dust, wind, um, soil, pesticides, you know, it all kind of keep, helps to keep that um, where it should be on, on the field. And so there are great buffers, especially as we see more of this, um, more of this um, kind of patchwork as our urban boundaries, you know, kind of move out into farmland even more. 
I anticipate they'll probably be um, established more and more. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the functions of these and I see um, you know, so many benefits that if even if you planted it primarily for a windbreak, maybe that it would also serve all of these other benefits. And so they're really just kind of neat. Um, they can um, provide benefits to wildlife, to um, humans, and also to our environment. Um, and they can be really tailored to your specific need. It can be tailored to your um, timeline, it can be tailored to what kind of budget you're working with and what environmental conditions you um, are working with as well. So here was a, um, a photo that they have buckwheat in the in the forefront here. And this was a pollinator. I think they have some asters growing also. And, and this was planted um, at least some of it for pollinators specifically. And so um, while it serves as a, as a nice buffer between field and maybe um, a working area, it also provides a nice um, nectar source and pollen source. And so this is an example of a really young uh, hedgerow. And, you know, a lot of us that might be establishing them, um, you know, they're in the early stages as mine is, they'll probably look a little bit more closer to this. So they're not going to be these huge, nice um, <laughs> windbreaks in the first few years. It will take some time to, to establish them, and we'll kind of talk about that. So this is a young hedgerow. Um, I believe this is on the Oregon State University um, campus, and they were um, uh, featuring a lot of native plants that provided um, habitat for beneficial insects and pollinators, and it kind of separates this orchard with this other field here. Um, they've got uh, red flowering currant in there, some Oregon grape. And so you can, you'll start to kind of see them. And I'm sure you guys have as, you, as you've uh, traveled through Oregon. And um, it's really kind of neat to get ideas on how these can look and perform in different environments. Take a look at my time here. Okay, so um, move this out of the way. So one of the um, ecological benefits of um, providing these hedgerows in managed landscapes is that they can really be um, designed to create habitat for a variety of um, mam small mammals, birds, um, beneficial insects. Um, you know, as we break up our fields more or our managed landscapes more with um, a little bit more diversity and um, um, plant diversity and, and structure diversity, it creates more edges basically. And with more edges, you create these things called ecotones, which is just that transition from one um, kind of managed landscape to the, to the next area where it's gonna, have uh, more species diversity there because it's going to be able to provide, um, like I said, different kinds of food, um, different kinds of shelter. Um, wind is a really big um, inhibitor for pollinators. So it, again, it breaks that wind up that um, dis, uh, disturbs pollinators sometimes. And um, they've and studies have shown also that these corridor, if you, if you design your, your hedges correctly, um, they can basically serve as safe corridors for wildlife to travel through. Um, and so it's really kind of neat, um, you know, to think about if, if this is something that you're interested in providing more habitat for wildlife, this is something you'd want to think about um, making sure that these corridors are somewhat connected to other um, natural or wild spaces. Um, it can provide shade for wildlife, which, um, you know, in, in big managed areas that, you know, maybe aren't timber is hard to come by sometimes in our, in our, in the Willamette Valley, at least, um, especially with like the grass seed fields out here. Um, and it can also provide really nice habitat for wildlife to feed and nest in and also care for their young. So uh, there are resources that will, um, you know, send with you guys if you're interested in uh, providing more wildlife habitat. 
and it will talk about what to think about, what plants to focus on if you, um, if that's one of your goals. Um, and then this was really interesting. Um, so, like I said, it's, it provides habitat for wildlife, but um, as we know, you know, pollinators uh, can <laughs> use whatever help that um, humans can give them these days. And so, um, if if especially if you're working, um, you know, or in or around a managed um, uh, crop field or, or farmscape, this is something that's going to benefit. Um, providing a habitat for pollinators is also going to benefit um, the pollination on your um, crop as well. So, you know, 75% of successful food production requires pollination. And so increasing anything that you can do to increase that habitat for them is going to improve your, um, your fruit set size, quality, and yield. Um, and so I do have pollinator plant recommendations um, in many of our publications. The ZRC Society has a great one that um, we'll give to you guys at the end. And basically when you're thinking about planting for wildlife and pollinators, just a real um, you know, basic principle to keep in mind is just planting a variety. Um, so while one a line of shrubs or trees is gonna provide um, you know, a benefit to breaking up the wind and, and kind of maintaining the soil, it's not really going to do much for um, nectar and pollen sources and habitats. So the more variety you can incorporate uh, into these hedgerows, the better, um, just as a general rule of thumb. And um, like I said, wind um, can also, um, you know, so it's not only um, going to uh, encourage soil erosion, it's going to um, disturb pollination as well. So really beneficial for pollinators. Um, and there's um, lots of good recommendations on how you can use different plants that flower at different times that you can incorporate into your hedgerow so that they provide um, a source of, of nectar and pollen for a good part of the year. So that's something to think about. Um, another really important benefit, and um, you know, we've all seen how we're getting more and more um, drought conditions every every summer. It, they can really facilitate water conservation. So, you know, planting a, a filter strip or a um, you know a buffer, whatever you want to call it, along your fields can really help retain water and actually reduce evaporation by reducing wind speed. So this is something that I'm looking at on my own property um, because we're um, starting a little farm business and I you know, have limited water resources. And so the more that I can keep that water where, I, where my crops are, um, the better for me. And so planting a, a buffer um, you know, that's perpendicular to where my wind is coming from is gonna help my crops um, uh, retain as much moisture as they can. Um, they also will catch and store that water in their root systems. Um, and so if you are um, working in a landscape that, um, you know, um, is edging up against a riparian area or a, a seasonal creek or anything like that, it's going to slow the rate of uh, runoff from that field. And so um, anything that you're putting down on your field will potentially be, um, you know, absorbed to a certain point by these um, filter strips. Um, and we'll talk about mulch in a little bit. Um, as all of you good gardeners know, mulch is a key to, um, you know, helping your plants um, thrive and, and survive um, and retain the moisture. So I thought this was a really telling graphic um, you know, intuitively you think, okay, yeah, if I put a barrier up, it's gonna, you know, reduce the wind speed, but I just didn't really realize how much um, these wind breaks um, reduce the wind velocity. And so you can see here by this, with this little diagram, um, you know, if the, the current wind speed uh, before this uh, wind break is, you know, 35 miles per hour, um, the, the currents actually are broken, are lifted and broken up into where you're only 
you know, getting about, um, you know, it's less than half of the velocity that it was before this break. And so it really is uh, significant. Um, and so the further away you get from the, the windbreak, um, you know, the faster the wind's gonna be, um, but designing them and, and, and putting them in the right location is really going to make this area right immediately um, after the windbreak um, quite um, a, a much better situation. Um, so really it works, you know, it can reduce wind speed up to 75%. And we've talked about how it can protect um, topsoil um, and, and reduce that soil and moisture loss that really is, um, you know, can accelerate a lot of problems on your, on your managed landscape. Uh, so this is, a, this is another one that, you know, we, we all know that we fight. <laughs> invasive uh, weeds and, and just weeds in general. And, um, you know, a lot of fields in the Willamette Valley where I live, um, you know, it's it's just the, the field and then it's a fence line and there's that bare space kind of like in between. And, you know, if, if it's not planted with anything, um, you know, guess what's gonna show up? And so um, those are sometimes maintained with, um, with sprays, but, you know, weeds are going to take over any kind of bare space eventually. Um, if it's not covered in something or it's not managed with something, some other plants, those weeds are going to um, take over. And so, you know, in uh, the spirit of trying to reduce our pesticide use and, and uh, working a little bit more sustainably, um, planting these bordered plants, just um, covering that, that bare space is going to prevent any kind of, or not any, but it's going to prevent a lot of um, weeds and invasive weeds from even getting established. So, you know, along um, roads or in between fields um, is also uh, going to help prevent the weed seeds from blowing into um, another area. Um, so, you know, just, just another benefit there that, um, you know, it's going to help that area that it's planted in, and then it's also going to help these weed seeds from moving around in the environment. Um, and, you know, it is kind of interesting too, we see a lot of blackberry brambles and we know um, that those are, you know, a huge headache for Oregonians in any kind of natural area. Um, they, you know, it's, it's hard to, to fight them back, but, you know, um, blackberries in and of themselves, you know, a hedge of blackberries can actually, it can provide some benefit. Um, so while you might not, not go out and plant, you know, Himalayan blackberry, um, if you have a hedge of, of blackberries and, you know, it's something that um, you can kind of work back and, and cut back um, over time, you know, maybe you can go to sleep a little easier knowing that, um, you know, those blackberry brambles do provide habitat. Um, they do um, help with runoff. Um, they do, um, you know, break up wind and soils erosion. So, um, you know, really it's like the structure that, that you're looking at and just having plants in those spaces. Um, so just, just know if you're gonna be taking out blackberries or invasives to get um, something else established, you just kind of want to do that. Have have a have a good plan and a timeline to make sure that you do replant those areas pretty quickly with um, you know native or non-invasive plants um, to prevent those blackberries from coming back. Um, so a lot of times when we are um, driving around uh, the Willamette Valley or in other parts of Oregon, um, you know, you, you see where, where I live anyways, we have a lot of uh, grass seed fields. And so a lot of them do have um, single species, you know, really long rows of trees. And they're not maybe, um, you know, as many as there, there should be, but you do see them out there. And so um, that's really going to help control some of that erosion out there and in, and, and in turn improve soil health. So if your um, you know, topsoil isn't blowing away all the time, 
and it's that material is going to stay in your field that's going to um, improve your improve your soil health and so um, it's also going to keep the nutrient loss uh, or the nutrients from from running off um, you know out of the fields where you don't want them so they can act as a, a basically a filter um, and they can increase surface water infiltration um, by just keeping that soil structure intact. And a lot of the uh, federal and um, like county programs that are um, maybe providing funding for this type of work or establishment um, a lot of it seems to be focused around riparian health. Um, and so this is um, an example of a nice planting that was um, done, you know, in a pasture area along a um, maybe a seasonal creek or just a riparian area. And um, this is where I see people having success with um, getting some like cost share programs for establishing, establishing hedgerows is tying it into riparian health. Um, and so that's just something to kind of keep in mind if you're um, going to go after some some grants or some um, some um, uh, public funding to get these established. Um, you'll have a little bit better luck, I think, if you tie it into if you're able to tie it into um, riparian health. Um, and so if you do have that along your property or it's something that you can um, can help maintain. Um, we, we know that um, riparian areas, the, the cooler basically they are, the healthier they are for aquatic um, environments and, and um, aquatic organisms. And so, you know, we're seeing rising temperatures in a lot of these um, riparian areas. And one way that we can significantly help reduce the um, water temperature and or at least maintain it as a cooler water temperature is to provide shade. And I, I thought I put the numbers on here, but it was pretty staggering to me when I was researching this, how well this works. Um, so just keeping this area shaded, um, it will really keep those water temperatures at healthy levels for those organisms that live in that riparian area. Um, and it, again, they're going to help, you know, these four rows here of, of plants are going to help keep, you know, runoff or, um, you know, if anything's supplied in this field here, fertilizer, pesticides, um, you know, you name it, it's going to keep it from going into the riparian area. Um, not all the way, but it's going to filter it out significantly. And so again, it's just something that it's um, real good practice to have if you um, have a riparian area. That's probably where I would focus on. Um, but again, it depends on what your what your goals are. And you know, if you don't have fences or you're not putting fences up, um, Putting really dense plantings along these areas if you have livestock is also going to help keep the livestock out of these riparian areas where they can further erode um, you know the streams and and um, and get in there okay i'm i'm kind of keeping an eye on the questions but it looks like they're being uh, answered by my team so thank you so much for following up on that um, and then borders and privacy um, screens are maybe another idea that you would think of in um, a bit more of a suburban um, environment. Um, you know, the closer you are to people, the less privacy you have, obviously. And so living fences um, can be something that you might consider if you have a little bit of space and you want to create something that's, you know, aesthetically pleasing to look at than just a big wooden fence. Um, so it can create that nice border. It can add privacy. The only thing that, um, you know, you really need to think about and consider in these um, closer spaces is um, spacing the plants and maintaining the plants is going to be quite different as opposed to out in a large field where you can plant, you know, as big as you can go out there. So 
you might um, focus a little bit more on large shrubs that you prune. Um, you're just gonna have to maintain them a little bit more than you would out in a larger area, but they can definitely work in suburban um, and urban environments. And even if you're, um, you're able to just plant, you know, a few species, then that's going to be better than than one, which might um, be susceptible to pests or other kinds of um, problems. And so, um, one of the reasons that that I'm I'm planting a hedgerow, which I'll show you guys in in just a little bit here, is I'm working on reducing um, well a lot of the wind from my neighboring grass seed field, but um, the dust is just atrocious out there in the summer and we're dining outside, you know, on our patio and, and it's just something that you, you know, you're kind of used to in an agricultural area, but it's, I'm, I'm planting my hedgerow so I can reduce the, um, the dust and, and the wind and maybe whatever they're putting down on the fields coming into my uh, property. And so as they grow and mature, they can really create um, pretty dense barriers. And it's gonna significantly reduce the amount of particles that are filtering through that area. And so it's going to allow those particles of um, dust or chemicals or, or, or whatever to filter slowly in instead of coming in big clouds and um, kind of depositing um, on, your, on your property. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of used to it out there and we understand that living out in the country, it comes with certain sacrifices. But if you're new to living next to a agricultural area or, um, you know, you just want to make um, your life a little more pleasant, it can kind of just cut down on some of those neighbor conflicts. And, you know, just knowing that you can do something that can kind of mitigate this a little bit. Um, it's always good to talk to your neighbor too, if you have a really bad issue, but this is something that you can do that's going to benefit everyone. Maybe they can go in on half. I don't know. <laughs> that would be great. Um, so I am in the process of establishing my hedgerow in the Willamette Valley, and this is our grass seed field right next to us, and this is our property here, and, you know, we just have this fence, and again, all this stuff just blows and blows and blows in the summer especially. So I, and these trees are probably not even on my hedgerow publication list, but again, working in my budget, I came across some very inexpensive cypress trees. I threw them in there um, this last fall and mulched them. And, um, you know, I, I tried to get larger um, plants there so they would mature faster. But I've also got my um, my native plants from the plant sale coming in this this month. And so I'll I'll start filling this in um, in different rows, and you know every year I'm going to hope and just incorporate different um, plantings in here. So I will have to irrigate this in summer to get these established, and I'll talk about that. Um, but I'm excited to see the progress, and it will be slow. Um, just know that this this is a um, a exercise in patience, but um, it's I think it will fill in nicely eventually. Um, another thing to consider if you are, if you are a farmer or looking to make some income, um, as a farmer is a lot of these could serve, you could plant a hedgerow or use a hedgerow, um, that also serves as a source of income. So, um, we're going to be starting a farm business soon and I will probably plant, I will probably lean towards species that I can use in cut flower arrangements, for example. So they can really provide, um, you know, different benefits there. Um, if you want potential products that you can sell, you might incorporate um, nut trees or berries. Um, uh, it really, it can, it can be tailored to whatever your um, interests and your needs are. Um, it can be used for propagated plant material if you have a nursery business or greenery for floral materials. Um, and um, again, really helping your um, crops if you are a farmer to, to reach that higher um, pollination rate. And this was an interesting one that um, I didn't really think of, but um, you know, some, some landowners um, 
have um, like managed hunting on their property. And these hedges are great habitat for quail and pheasant and sage grouse. And so, you know, it could be actually managed to create habitat for your um, hunting, um, your managed hunting. So I thought that was kind of a unique um, benefit that um, some of the folks out in Siletz might, <laughs> might utilize. Um, okay, I'm gonna try and kind of speed up a little bit so I can get through a lot of this material. Again, it can be used large farms, small farms, the application can go from um, large to small, from urban to suburban. Um, Agroforestry is another term that's kind of used interchangeably with these plantings. Um, um, and it can also be used in wetlands. Just the general concept. So here's some nice pictures of suburban lots that, you know, you might not think of this as a hedgerow, but it really is providing the height. It's providing the um, the different species um, diversification here, providing wildlife habitat for this guy, <laughs> um, and it's got a really nice aesthetic. So in suburban lots, it just might look a little different, and it's really up to you as the landowner to um, figure out what that looks like. So. These are all things to consider if you're looking at installing a hedgerow. Um, it's basically the same things that you would consider with any planting. Um, there is um, a few principles that I want to go over, though, um, just so if you have the room and you want to do it um, in a way that maximizes the benefit, you generally want to place the tallest plant uh, at maturity in the center of the row, and I'll show you that in a second, with the shorter plantings going out to the edges. Because um, again, that will just help that, um, that wind barrier. And if possible, um, you want to orient the rows perpendicular to the prevailing winds. So that might seem like obvious, but um, that is something that you just want to make sure when you're designing these, you're you're going perpendicular to those winds. And when you can, um, if you don't have fences or if you're not um, you know, limited by neighbors, if you can follow the land contours and create meandering lines rather than straight lines, that is gonna help create more, more of those edges. So more of those ecotones for wildlife. So if you think about um, designing them that follows the, the natural lines of the, of the land, that's gonna provide more benefit for wildlife. So here's a nice little um, design here that just really basic, um, you know, we have, let's see, we've got kind of these two rows of big trees in the center, and then they're coming out with some more um, deciduous and evergreen shrubs um, in the middle. And then they follow with some grasses and flowers on the end here. And so that's a general design to follow, again, if you can, and if you have the space, that's gonna provide the most habitat. And then you can also kind of come in and fill in these areas eventually with shade tolerant plants so that weeds don't come up there. Or you can just keep that really nice and mulched. Um, I'm not sure if I have this on a slide, but when you're when you're establishing these um, and when they're smaller, you might consider if you don't want to mulch, you might consider leaving enough space to mow in between your plantings. So you know if you have a four foot mower or something, you might just make sure you plant your um, your lines four feet apart so that you can maintain uh, that area as the trees mature. And then once they're a little bit more mature, you won't have to worry about that so much. Um, so in general, again, we're, I'm not gonna go into real specific plant selection because um, this is across Oregon. A lot of you guys are in all different climates and um, um, I'll send you the, the, the plant list that we would recommend for different climates at the end. But in general, just a wide variety um, of different level plants, so multi-tiered. It's gonna give you maximum habitat. Um, of course, we wanna avoid any um, invasive plants, um, any, any varieties that are real susceptible to common pests or diseases is gonna be a no-no um, if you can help it. 
um, again, consider the conditions that the plants will need to survive in this. Um, and, and consider if you can irrigate for the first few years, that might not be an option. So you might need to focus on drought tolerance stuff. Um, and just try and plant plants together that have similar needs. So, um, you know, if it's a really soggy there all year round or most of the year round, you know, you might not want to plant stuff there that can't tolerate um, some some wet feet. Um, um, I, I work on the Oregon coast and so we had some suggestions here of nice um, hedges that could be planted. A lot of people use Escalonia out there and it's it's really beautiful and it, it grows very fast. Uh, wax myrtle is another um, uh, plant that um, is used out there that can provide nice hedges and then for the lower, we would fill in with like maybe some hebes or utilizing um, the native salal, um, huckleberry, holly, all of these things would provide a nice planting of a hedge at the, at the coast. Um, this is a really nice diagram that Signa Danler put together, who's um, what she works with our Master Gardener program online, and this was with the Benton County Soil and Water Conservation District, and they came out with some guides recently as well. And this is a lovely design that Signa created, and it shows the different plants that she used here. Um, I, I will also load, uh, upload this presentation on the website so that you guys can um, go back to this if you want. Um, but so you can see here, she has her large trees and shrubs in the center. Um, she used elderberry, um, ocean spray, vine maple, mock orange. I think most of these were native plants that she used in this one. Um, this is for 100 foot by 40 feet. Um, so you can kind of start to see what that would look like. Um, and, you know, again, choose plants that you have access to um, that serve your own needs. Um, this is really going to be a nice pollinator hedgerow as well because it utilizes a lot of natives and a lot of diversity. Um, so again, really, really nice just um, um, example of a, what a design might look like for a hedgerow here. I don't know if Cigna's on here. I didn't see her, but um, so with any, um, you know, planting, Soil prep is going to be um, something important to consider before you establish these. Um, you can establish your planting areas on smaller sites um, by, um, you know, perhaps sheet mulching the area, um, like the season before you plant. So it just depends on what scale you're working on. Um, that might be something that you would use in small uh, suburban areas. Um, but for larger sites, what um, you, you might do if you have the foresight um, is till the ground in the spring and plant a cover crop. Um, and so that will help um, um, kind of get the, that area established and get some nice nitrogen cycling in there and basically you'll incorporate that as a green manure in late summer. And then you can plant another cover crop um, that again, you can till in in spring and then you would install your first planting for a hedgerow. I did not do this. Um, I'm kind of a lazy gardener. And so I just kind of dug my holes in fall and um, mulched it heavily around each of the plantings. But, um, and I did space it out enough that I can mow in between until that fills in, but you know, these are just types of things to consider. You can you can do early prep to the site um, and you would probably have better success if you um, are able to do that, those types of practices. Um, with most, um, well, with most new plantings, I, I think it is beneficial to plant in fall. You can always plant in spring. Um, that's always a good time to install plants as well, but you're gonna have to irrigate right away. Um, so if you have, um, if you can get your first planting um, done in fall, that will allow the roots of those uh, plants to get established and take advantage of the winter rains. Um, and so I haven't had to irrigate mine yet, but I will, you know, this summer. Um, 
but again, you can, I'm also going to do an installment this, um, this spring with, with more plants. So it's good to um, incorporate amendments like compost or manure. Again, if you have access to that, um, if it's a really large site, you know, you, you might, that might not make sense, but, um, and again, supplemental irrigation is probably going to be needed in the first two or three years. So that's another thing to think about um, if you have the ability to do that. Um, so um, if you're on a field um, and you have the ability to just extend your crop irrigation to your hedgerow, that's wonderful. You can also use swales, furrows, um, or drip irrigation and soaker hoses to irrigate those guys. I'll check the time here. Okay. I think we're actually doing good on time. <laughs> um, so I wanted to throw in a cost um, just to just to consider, you know, what's really feasible for you. You know, plants do cost money and and you just need to maybe plan out your um, your plantings in um, different sections. So, you know, one year you do phase one of your of your um, your plantings, and then the next year you might um, buy um, the second phase of your installment plants. And so think about that if um, cost is a barrier to purchasing these um, plants. Um, I know it is for for a lot of folks, and I don't want that to um, you know inhibit your ability to to um, to utilize these. Um, of course, if you buy larger plants, they're going to reach maturity sooner. So, you know, if you are in an urban area and you just really need that privacy screen right away, you might spend the money on um, mature plants. Um, if you have the time and the space to let these mature over time, then it might be um, it might be a good idea to look at some of your native plant um, or seedling sales. So, in a lot of counties. The soil and water conservation districts do native plant sales that you can get um, material for relatively inexpensive. Um, the Oregon Small Woodlands Association in some counties also holds a seedling sale. Um, and they do have some native plants, but generally those would be for um, conifer species. Um, but you don't have to get, you know, a ton. You can, you can go to these sales and get what you need and they're very inexpensive. Um, and then, like I said, some um, government programs are available for hedgerow installment. I know NRCS had a program that they were specifically for hedgerows. They kind of cycle in and out um, based on their uh, organization priorities. So you might just call your local NRCS rep and see what you um, might qualify for. And I think normally those are uh, cost share programs. So um, they would kind of meet you in the middle on the cost and or reimburse you on the cost. Um, and you kind of, you know, become, um, you get into a relationship with NRCS and um, they will come out there and kind of help you design those and, and um, install those for maximum benefit. Um, so those are some resources to consider. Um, you know, another just thing to, to think about, um, if you're gonna go to all the trouble of planning these, purchasing the plants, designing these, um, planting them, you know, you really wanna make sure that you're going to be able to manage these over the course of however long they need to get um, established. So making it as easy as possible for you to manage those weeds, manage the bare areas with mulch or low growing plants. Um, and some, some areas you might want to uh, consider little wildlife uh, barriers that will protect your trees and larger shrubs from um, holes and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so the, these are just things to, to think about to prevent problems down the road. Um, 
So we all know it's a big headache if we go to all this work and then, you know, half of the things survive. It's really, really frustrating. And then you don't want to do it again. <laughs> um, so again, here are some of the local um, uh, federal and local programs that you can utilize for hedgerow establishment. I would just call your, your, um, your rep through USDA, um, NRCS programs. They have different um, programs that may or may not be um, active in your county. And so just give them a call and see what they can do. And I believe the Xerxes Society also maybe has some resources for hedgerow establishment focusing on pollinators. Um, so that, that might be a place to check out as well. Um, and if anybody knows of any other, um, you know, resources for hedgerow establishment, please throw it in the, um, please um, throw it in the Q and A, and we can put in a, um, we can put it in the chat. Let's see. I think I have one more. Oh, okay. So here are the. Um, the publications that I've um, thrown up here and I used for this. Um, I believe you can click on these. Maybe only I can. Um, one of the other panelists want to see if you can click on that link and it'll take you to the, that or. No, Pammy, I can't. Um, okay. So um, if you guys, I'll, I'll keep that up and maybe we can. Um, get those links in the chat for you, or you can just copy and paste and, and throw those into Google and they're all online um, sources that can pop up. Um, so I can kind of work on that here. And Pammy, I think we can make the slide deck available along with the recording on the Growing Organ Gardeners website so folks will have access. Yes. Yep, um, we will put that on the website and um, I'll make sure to just pull out these links for you guys so that you can um, just click on them and, and, and start researching for your own hedgerow. Um, you know, I hope, um, I'm sure many of you have, have planted these before or are interested in, in these and, um, you know, I'd love to see your, I'd love to see your progress and your designs. I don't know if there's a way that we could you know, share those on the Master Gardener Facebook page. Um, if someone's able to throw up our Facebook page, that would be really neat to just start sharing some of these um, these um, plantings. I would love to see what people come up with. And um, yeah, so that that is all I have, I believe. Yep. And we could, we have a couple minutes for questions. I don't know if there's any burning questions that are lingering here. I mean, one that's come up that um, you might be better able to answer. Amy asked a little while ago for some examples of some of the mistakes that you referred to. Um, she might like try, to try to avoid. Yeah, I think with anything, um, Amy, it's just a matter of making sure you do your homework on what species, um, you know, are, are going to work well in your climate. Um, and so let me pull up, um, I'm gonna, am I still sharing my screen? Okay, I think I am. Let me see if I can pull this up here. <laughs> I've got too many things open. Um, okay, here we go. So um, yeah, right, right plant, right place is kind of the mantra that you wanna, um, keep in mind, Amy, for something like, and really, I am very practical. Well, I try to be very practical about what I can do. So if it's, um, you know, try to try to maybe plan this out in phases, I think I would recommend for somebody that might be new to, to doing this and make sure you have the time to um, manage these plants as they're getting established, you know, to water, to mulch, to prune them, to um, to weed. And so you don't spend a whole bunch of money and time and then you're not able to maintain it. Um, watering is going to be something just to consider um, in the dry season. I don't know where you live, but, um, you know, in most places, um, 
they, they're probably going to need some summer irrigation or just consider drought tolerant um, plantings. As far as other mistakes, you know, I, I think it's just making sure you're doing the right planning. Um, and, you know, if I, I don't think that you could plant a wrong plant unless you're planting an invasive or something like that, but you can always change things up if you, if you do find that, you know, it just wasn't what you were uh, hoping to get out of it. But this is our hedgerow publication with OSU, and we have a list based on, we have a list of um, plants based on um, height and kind of climate a little bit or um, conditions. So we have sun tolerant plants that are, you know, um, tree species here that you can go in and look through. Um, we have um, lots of recommendations for those kind of mid-sized large shrubs um, that would go in the middle of your planting. Um, and some ground cover. So this would be a, a good place to start. And also a lot of those other resources at the end that I threw up have really excellent um, recommendations for plants. And um, I, you know, maybe even talk to some folks in your area that um, are, you know, um, are gardeners or farmers and, and just get their, get their feedback too on what they might, um, you know, have, have you work with as far as plant selection go. Um, any, any other questions that we, oh, I'm seeing a question about <laughs> encouraging rats um, with the hedgerow. Yeah, I think as a suburban gardener, if you don't um, need a super dense um, barrier, that might be a good idea to um, leave some space in there to manage that. Um, but really with rats, I think you just want to make sure you're not leaving um, compost or food, you know, you're covering your compost and stuff like that up. Um, those are more so I think where you can attract the, the invasive rats. So. Pammy, this is Nicole. I do see uh, another question about uh, compatibility with cows or other livestock and whether you'd recommend installing a hard fence before you planted materials. If so, what does repair and maintenance look like for that situation? Yeah, it, if you have the ability to um, establish fence, even, even just, yeah, you know, um, a wire fence before you have your plantings, that's probably the best um, scenario. But if you, um, because, you know, uh, unless the hedge is really thick and established, it's not going to keep the livestock out of the riparian area altogether. Um, but if you don't have the ability to put in a, um, a fence, then I would just make sure to avoid any plants that are toxic to uh, cattle. And I know we have a publication that lists those things to watch out for. Um, I don't know if one of you guys can can throw that in the chat or the Q and A. Um, so I just make sure to avoid any plants that are um, known to be toxic to cattle. So I would probably put the plantings um, in between a fence and the riparian area. Um, any Pammy, maybe I'll just give some closing remarks here for folks who want to head off, um, just to give information about our next um, presentation, and then we can continue with Q&A as long as you need to. So just yeah, to I do have to pick up my kiddo in about five minutes, so <laughs> I'll a little bit longer. But thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. And we'll get those links and uh, other information out to you. And our next uh, webinar series will be Dirt Gone Bad When Your Soil Amendment Has Been Contaminated, and that will be on March 9th. And you can find registration information for that on our Growing Organ Gardeners uh, Level Up Series website. And then um, the recording of this presentation, along with Pammy's uh, PowerPoint slides with links, will also be available on that site.
So thank you, everyone. Um, I'll stay on for a couple more minutes and try and answer some of these um, questions in the Q and A. Um, I will put the link to that uh, WSU thesis here in just a second. I'm trying to pull it up. <laughs> I have to go through my whole thing here. Okay, there it is. Just a reminder, oh. I've also posted the link for the survey. And uh, if you were signed up, you will also get an email with that in it. But for those of you that are watching on Facebook, I have also dropped that in our chat. Um, saying that the feedback form link does not work. Okay, perfect. And I, yes, Matt, I will post the resources in the chat. Um, trying to figure out <laughs> where that is. Okay. Um, oh, nice. A Huga culture hedge. That would be interesting. <laughs> Let us know how it goes. Google these real quick. Okay, thank you, Jed. I thought it was working. I tested it and we've got 41 responses already. So I posted it in there again. Maybe the one, maybe it was missing a letter. Thanks everyone. We appreciate you guys tuning in. I'm just pulling up the rest of those publications here for folks. I should have had this ready ahead of time. So I was prepared. I'm gonna attempt to end our live share. If I can find for Facebook's. Thank you all for tuning in on Facebook. For those of you that did, we are glad we were able to offer that as a secondary option of watching. All right, I got one more. I'm going to throw in the chat for folks that are hanging on still. All right, there we go. Oh, Alana, if you're still on, I'll send you the seedling sale information <laughs> soon. <laughs> Okay, I think we got most of those questions somewhat answered. So I hope uh, we are good to go. Thanks everyone.